Hello and welcome to Insights for Manufacturing. I'm your host, Jeff Beecham, and throughout this series, we'll be looking at some of the trends, challenges, and opportunities facing UK manufacturing in 2022. In this series, I'm hosting a range of guests from service businesses, support organizations, and academia, providing subject matter expertise and guidance on a diverse range of topics affecting UK manufacturing. Today, we're going to be discussing the collaboration between academia and UK manufacturing, with a specific focus on a hugely popular and growing technology, additive manufacturing. So my special guest today was voted one of the top 100 UK influencers in manufacturing by the manufacturer in 2021. And in 2018, was voted into the top 50 women in engineering by the Women's Engineering Society and the Daily Telegraph. So I'm delighted to welcome Kate Black, who is the Professor of Manufacturing at the University of Liverpool and CTO at Meta Additive. Welcome, Kate, and how are you? I'm great, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. It's good good to have you on. And, um, you know, you are the first guest from the field of academia. So uh, I'm really keen to, to get into this discussion today. Yeah. Can you tell us about your journey, Kate, to becoming Professor of Manufacturing at the University of Liverpool? Yeah, well, wh- where do we start? It, <laughs> it wasn't... It wasn't um, the I suppose it wasn't a typical uh, route to, to becoming a professor. Um, I've only just recently been uh, promoted to professor here at Liverpool, so I'm probably about five weeks in, so pretty box fresh as a professor. Um, but yeah, I'm here at the University of Liverpool in the School of Engineering, but actually I'm a, a chemist by training, so my undergraduate degree was in chemistry, and then my PhD, I moved to, to, to Liverpool to do my PhD. Uh, in, in materials and, and chemistry. So it's not a straightforward route. I didn't really have a straightforward route going to university either. Um, I, I quite struggled at school. Um, I was dysle- I'm dyslexic, so I struggled with writing exams. Um, but yeah, I've slowly, you know, persevered, got through. Um, and as I said, I came to, to Liverpool in 2004 as a PhD student. Um, I then spent some time after I got my PhD in, in, in Cambridge and uh, did a postdoc there and came back to Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Um, but how did I become a professor? Well, I, I started as an academic in 2013. I got my first uh, lecturing position here in the School of Engineering. Um, and I started to, to look at whether we could apply mm-hmm. some of the chemistries I've been using in my PhD and apply those into to, to printing. And it was 2D printing at the time. Um, so printed of things like printed electronics, circuit boards, um, RFID tags. Um, and then I had a conversation with one of my colleagues who was a professor here at the time um, in Liverpool who worked in additive manufacturing. And I thought, I wonder whether we could, you know, use these chemistries and start putting a, a more of a material slant to, to additive manufacturing. Mm. Um, so we started collaborating together had lots of conversations um, and joining those two different uh, disciplines. And I think that's really what um, has helped me excel, certainly in, in, in my research and brought a different approach to, to doing manufacturing. Um, and then I was promoted to, to senior lecturer. Um, oh, when was it now? I think four or five years ago, four years ago. Yeah, and then, then I started my meta-additive journey uh, back in 2018. Um, and it's really progressed from there. So Professor really is, is the, um, the top of a- academia, um, in, certainly in, uh, in the research and teaching. And um, no, I was really pleased to, to be promoted uh, you know, four or five weeks ago. So it, it's um, been an eventful journey, uh, but yeah, finally got there. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's fantastic to hear about that. I mean, you, you've you've sort of faced a number of, uh, you know, adversities, you know, um, yeah. you know, dyslexia is something that's, you know, it's fairly common. Um, and yeah. I, I, I did hear that, you know, a lot of people don't find out they are dyslexic until, you know, quite far on into their, well, sometimes childhood, but sometimes yeah, adulthood yeah. as well. Yeah, um, definitely. So considering considering all of that, you know, and, and, and as you said, you know, you... You, you didn't do as well as you would have liked at, at school mm-hmm. to then mm-hmm. become a professor in, in, <laughs> in a in a you know a scientific um 
field wow how inspiring is that you know and um you know every, everybody knows we we need more females in in engineering yeah. and science you know the whole stem um field and and what a great example of somebody who you know initially struggled but through all that sort of grit and determination and yeah. passion for for what you do and, and where you probably wanted to aspire to you, you've yeah. actually made all that happen so yeah, if I think I, to write a I, book I, on how to do it. You've actually done it. <laughs> well, I, I always tell you know my my students I'm quite honest and open and say that you know it. it as I think a lot of people think, oh, professors, they're somehow these um, you know magical mythical beings that uh, <laughs> are sort of not like us, um, and that's really not the case. And it's what I thought when I when I first started, really, and then. You know, now I am one. I know that they're just normal people. They're real people. Yeah. Um, and I, I often say to my students that, you know, it, it wasn't straightforward for me. I think it's important, you know, um, the way we get taught at, at school isn't necessarily, you know, suited to, to quite a lot of people, actually. Mm. You know, there's a lot of uh, neurodiversity out there that have got a lot to offer, um, many disciplines, but certainly in, in science and engineering. And I think where we're doing ourselves a disservice by um well cutting them off you know I was certainly told that I would I would never go to university um you know and I think that can that can break a a, a child you know growing up saying that but for me I'd, I you know I've got I've got great parents who were very supportive they they, they knew I wasn't you know stupid um yeah, yeah. although I'd been you know told that on a regular basis at, at, at school and I just I just use that as a sort of um, persevere, you know, prove yeah. them wrong. And yeah. uh, I've done that now. So, <laughs> so you, you must have Come an on. element of stubbornness within your uh, within your your DNA, um, within your personality to, yeah. you know, because persevering with one thing is, you know, because you can persevere to get something done. Yeah. But then you can also have that stubborn streak um, and stubbornness is all, you know, it's it's often seen as a bad trait I'm quite stubborn I've, I've <laughs> often been told oh you're too stubborn it's it's, it's a bad trait <laughs> but in your scenario you know it's almost like that did you know did you have that well you've told me that I'm never going to aspire to mm. you, you know to um to go into university this is what I want to do and I'm I'm going to show you what was there an element of stubbornness about it or I think stubbornness I don't know stubbornness I just I just didn't agree with them. And I did, thought that, you know, um, how can somebody say that to somebody so young? Yeah. Um, because they're not a, a, an expert, you know. Um, okay, they might be a, a great history teacher or a great chemistry teacher, but do they have the right to, to, to crush somebody's, you know, hopes? And I think hope's really important. Um, and you give people hope and you believe in them and they suddenly blossom and and I certainly did you know when I yeah. when I came to, to to Liverpool as a PhD student you know my my supervisors they, they they believed in me and I think that 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 was sort of the switch for me and also doing things that that suited me I wasn't having to do exams you know yes I had to write a, a PhD thesis at the end um but I had time to 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 do that and I was yeah. doing what I was doing um I liked best and that was being practical hands-on you know laboratory stuff and yeah. yes I had to do reading and 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 um lots of writing but it, it wasn't under time conditions I mean who, who, whoever designed exams for 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 students I, I don't know I don't even know where that came from it's just <laughs> it's, it's it's bonkers you know a lot of it's retention of uh information and can, can you memorize that well that's not what we need to do in, in the yeah. real world we need to be able, able to apply that that information and that that knowledge Absolutely. so yeah I think it's perseverance and going once you've done one hurdle for me it was like well you never get to university well I got to university well I've done that so maybe I can do the next thing and, and you build more and more confidence and mm. I was saying to a, a, a colleague earlier on this this week that you know being professor for, uh, to, to me is maybe go well um I've made that now and I feel much more uh, comfortable in my own, uh, my own self yes um because you know it's you've persevered and you've done that so and and not having the 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 fear of failure because um you know i've failed many times in my life but i've 
I've got where I've, you know, I've got to. And that's because you, you use those opportunities to, to, to learn a lesson yeah. rather than seeing it as a failure and as a bad thing. Absolutely right. Well, that's, a, that's a great story and uh, one that, you know, should be an inspiration for, for the next generation of people aspiring to, uh, you know, to go to university or, you know, become lecturers or professors themselves. Yeah, you know, yeah, you certainly need yeah. more people like, like yourself doing that. So you. additive manufacturing um, and 3D printing have been around for some time now. Um, as far as I understand, the technology is constantly evolving what what are the biggest benefits, Kate, to to manufacturers who who utilise additive manufacturing? Well, as you say, it's, it's come on a, a, a long way. So it started uh, out as really a rapid prototyping tool, and it, and it's still there. And and many manufacturers excel at uh, using um, AM for 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 rapid prototyping. So that's that's still a positive benefit that that we see. But now that because um, things have improved, the types of materials that we're using um, have come on leaps of bound. We've still got a long way to go, but there's there's a much broader palette of materials that are, are now coming through the different um, additive manufacturing technologies. And we use sort of additive manufacturing as a, a broad umbrella, um, but... <sighs> What I refer to really is the, the metals and the ceramics. The polymer side, the plastic side is, is slightly different. It's still doing great, great stuff, and, but it, it does have a strong domain in, in sort of prototyping. Um, but customization really of, of, of parts, it's got much more um, the design freedom that additive manufacturing allows you to, to, to have is much greater. Um, and we can start to, to modify parts manufacturers can start to to look at parts and go actually maybe we do that slightly different and it, and it speeds that up but the the design freedom is a, is a is a big benefit you know the the bespoke and when we say bespoke i'm talking about geometric bespoke yes it's, um and we'll, we'll come on to to more about materials later i'm sure um but yeah the bespoke nature in terms of um, geometric freedom that it allows that you just couldn't get with with subtractive manufacturing or conventional manufacturing. Yeah, yeah, and, that, and that's an interesting one because I, I, I guess you know over the over the initial years of, of, of additive manufacturing, uh, manufacturers were were designing products but were sometimes limited, I guess, by the processes available to them. Yeah. Um, because I, I was over at the MTC a few weeks ago with with Mike Wilson, the chief automation officer, and we were having a look at some parts that had been uh, produced by additive manufacturing. And there was this very complex, it was almost like, um, not like a honeycomb, but a sort of mesh type yeah, yeah. structure. Like structure. Yeah, 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 and there's just no possible way you could machine the, through the middle oh. of that, you know, and, and just by building up those those layers and, and adding the, the yeah. material is the only way to do it. So before yeah. all this came about, um, I suppose design engineers were, were, well, they were limited by. Yeah. And I think, I think processes. you still do, you do still see that a lot where people go, well, you know, batteries is a, a really good example. Mm. Uh, cylindrical. Um, when actually maybe they could be a completely different geometry, but you need to be able to, print those with the suitable yeah. materials and that's i mean that's some of the things that we, we've been looking at um at the university but also in in meta the uh, spin-out company but yeah i think it's that design freedom and, and we'll see more of that as that palette of materials start to to broaden yeah we'll start to see more applications that are applicable that would would work for for additive manufacturing um but there's there's energy saving aspects in there you know your because by the very nature of adding material layer by layer and you're not taking material away, there's a, there's a material, more a material efficiency, but it doesn't always work. It, it depends on, on which application you, you're referring to, but mm -hmm. there is that uh, aspect of energy saving. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important as we, we move on. Um, if the future manufacturing, we're looking at reserving you know, energy, not yes. wasting materials. So I think additive manufacturing has probably got a, a, a big role to play in more sustainable manufacturing brilliant and that's the way things are going isn't it you know net zero yeah. um carbon neutral yeah sustainability so that upward trajectory of the the popularity of, of am mm -hmm. is just going to continue uh that's it's not going to sort of taper off anytime soon i, I guess 
No, I think I think there's there's been a lot of hype over the last 20, you know, 30 years and maybe some slight disappointment uh, in areas because I think there was maybe a bit of too much overhype um, at the, the, the beginning. Mm. Um, but now that people have started to look more on the materials, I mean, the engineering side is, is, is always important. We, we need the machines. Um, but it's what are the materials that we're putting in there yeah. is what we're going to get out. And I think yeah. now that yeah. we've had more focus on materials, we'll, we'll start to see that acceleration and uptake of additive manufacturing and maybe a, a broader portfolio of you know sectors. Because you, yeah. you've got sectors like um, uh, aerospace or um, military, you know, and, and certainly in the, the biomedical field as what have long been users of additive manufacturing. Mm. But what about places like the automotive industry where, yes, they use it for niche, uh, you know, high value products. But can we get additive manufacturing brought into to more general uh, mass manufacturing? Because additive manufacturing and mass manufacturing are sort of a, an oxymoron at, at, at yeah. the moment. Yeah. There, are, there are many sort of um, companies, but also researchers looking at pushing towards taking additive manufacturing from that small scale to, to, to large scale. And that's some of the things that we, we were looking at to, to do. Interesting. So, so let's talk about the, the, the science and the materials themselves then for, for a mm -hmm. second. So what materials are in high demand for, for additive manufacturing and how have you been involved in the development of the, the, the sort of processes and applications? Yeah, I think, I think, so I'm going to leave polymers to the polymer experts. And so really I'll talk mainly focus on, on metals, yep. uh, but there are some ceramic stuff that, that we're doing as well. And ceramics is a really interesting area, I think, in 3D printing and one that we'll see acceleration in. Um, but materials that are in high demand, you know, your stainless steels, um, titanium alloys, um, certainly things like Aluminium, aluminium alloys, they've got a big uptake in, in light weighting for, yeah. for aerospace. But things like nickel, uh, cobalt chrome, um, they're all materials that the broad sector of industries are, are interested in. But you also start to see more uptake in things like the energy materials, so copper and, and copper alloys for, for thermal management, you know, heat, heat mm. transfer. Um, so they're really important. Um, what I do as, a, as a, an academic, but also with my industrial CTO hat on, um, is very much about broadening that palette of materials, but also um, tweaking those materials so they fit to an application. Right. I think what's really happened in the, in the past in, say, binder jet printing and uh, laser-based, uh, you know, powder-based manufacturing it's been a kind of a, a one size fit all mm -hmm. because the materials come from the powder bed. And so you're kind of limited to, to the properties that you can get. Yeah, there's been some great work on um, the way that we bind them together or the lasers that you might use. Um, and can we optimize those powders? And the, there's great work done in there. Um, but really um, our approach is trying to manipulate those materials at the molecular level. So really yeah. coming at it from a material science point of view, uh, but also a chemistry point of view. And can you use chemistries to give you a much broader palette of materials, not just terms in actual, the actual materials themselves, but um, things like conductivity, thermal conductivity, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, strength of a part, um, and seeing whether we can broaden that out. So it, it, it suits the actual application need rather than shoehorning applications into, you know, the, into the materials. Right. And just from an outsider looking in, how, how far along is the, is the AM sector in terms of developing these materials for applications? I mean, if you, if you were starting off at zero and this is where you needed to, this is where industry needed to, to get to, yeah. How, how much work has been done in this and how, how far have you, you got to go yet? Yeah, I think I, there's loads of work that's been done on, on, on materials. Um, but it's been, it's been, in my opinion, it's been done in a, in a, a certain approach. Mm. So they've gone, okay, um, let, let's look at the powder-based um, technologies like laser um, SLM, laser-based powder fusion or, or binder jet. 
all your material is coming from a powder bed. So there's only a certain amount of things you can do to the materials to get them to do what you want them to do. Yeah. Our approach is now saying, well, can you also bind them with functional materials rather than a polymeric glue, which is what you con- conventionally find in, in, in binder jet printing? And by binding but permeating those powder beds with other materials, you start to broaden that palette of materials, but you start to be able to control what those materials can do. You're lowering the, the, the heat treatment um, temperature, the shortening the, the heat treatment cycle. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're adding, you know, sintering agents in there, um, but also producing materials that perhaps can't be produced by conventional additive manufacturing. Um, and so I think... We've done. We've come a very long way. There are there are great many great applications of uh, of you know where materials in additive manufacturing have excelled and have allowed people to to do great wonderful things in manufacturing. But I think we've still got quite a long way to go before we really open up the the true potential of additive manufacturing. Mm. We talked about um, the word bespoke for additive manufacturing before, and we, we well, people say bespoke, but they're talking about geometric bespoke. If we can start to manipulate materials more and combine that with uh, bespoke geometries, but also bespoke materials, I think the it will you'll see a great acceleration in, in additive manufacturing because we right. can start to manipulate the materials to to do what we need to do. So take for example um, a battery, you know, or a solid oxide fuel cell, where interfaces really important for the, yeah. the working efficiency of, of, a, of a device. Could we start to manipulate through additive manufacturing, through the use of chemistry, how those interfaces interact? Can we improve them? Can we optimize them and therefore optimize the end product that you're printing? So it's not just a, a shaping tool is additive mm. manufacturing. You're actually making materials in situ and controlling those. And I think that's the next level of, of additive manufacturing. But we can only do that by bringing a much more diverse um, workforce into the AM arena. So it was very heavily um, engineering focused. And mm. the engineers, they do great, great work on um, the, the hardware that we use. Um, but now we need to marry that with the material scientists, you know, the chemists, yeah. the physicists um, and, and bring some some take it up to that, you know, that that next level. It's about the the combination of a, a diverse community or what we would call a an AM ecosystem. You need that AM ecosystem in, in place to take it to the next level. I think we've maybe been slightly slow on, on, on doing that. Um, okay. Uh, and we, we, we look things like the software, you know, if you if you're having um, multi materials or you've got bespoke materials, you also need the software to be able to back up all those that system. You need the print heads to be able to to print things, the right types of lasers. If you're using a laser based uh, process um, that can process much wider um, palette of materials. So it's getting all of those pieces of the ecosystem in, in, in place. And we're starting to see that happen now. Wow, so it, it sounds like a, a huge scientific jigsaw to me, and and what yeah, an exciting, right. uh, yeah. what an yeah. exciting proposition. So I look, I look forward uh, over the next few years to the, the you know, the, this what seems like a you know a, a, a fantastic step change, you know, or or the you know yeah. taking the next step. Um, that's absolutely wonderful. So. Mm-hmm. There seems to to me, uh, and this is not just relevant to additive manufacturing, but in general, there seems to be a gap between academia and industry. Why is that? And you know, what what can be done, or what is being done, from your, mm-hmm. your perspective, to to bridge that gap? Well, I think I'd first say that, that there can be. I mean, there are some academics who will do a great job of of interacting with with um, with industry and and taking. Um, knowledge that has been developed in universities um, or research institutions and and taking those out into to the, the world of manufacturing. So they do already exist, but we need more of those. And I think yeah. probably those ones that do do that are in the manufacturing arena anyway. So they're they're sort of like minded. But then if we take more of the lower TRL levels of say chemistry, biology or physics, I think 
they're not in the same mindset. They go, I've made this molecule or I've, you know, found out whatever that might be. Um, I'll move on to the next thing now. Rather than going, well, what could that be used for? How, how do I scale it up? Um, and often you see, you know, and it's not to take anything away, but you, you see somebody's going to say, oh, we've made a, we've made a, a fuel cell or we've made a solar panel that's like 70, 90% of, or 90% efficient, but it's the size of a postage stamp and it would never be able to be scaled. And there's a lot of learning and understanding and you need those, to, you need that to happen. But yeah, you also yeah. need something to bridge the gap and it's, maybe we don't have enough people that can bridge the gap because it's not just, it's not just well academia are not taking it to industry. Often industry doesn't know what they need to ask for or how to communicate with, yeah. with the yeah. academics. And I think it really is that fundamental, um, it fundamentally comes down to um, the wrong language. You know, we're not communicating yeah. with the same, same language. We've got different constraints, I suppose, you know, the, the things that drive academics to, to get to be professors are not necessarily the same driving forces as in, in manufacturing. Yeah. Um, often in academia, we like to go from one project to a, a, another and change, whereas you can't do that in, in industry. You need to, to keep your time, you know, your, your margins on, on spec. You need to get your products out on time. And, and sometimes you, you, I think there's a clash there, but it doesn't mean that it can't be done. You know, and I think what we've done at Liverpool and with the spin out of Meta Additive is, is a really great example of how you can take fundamental research yeah. and, and, and move that along that chain so that it can be exploited and it can be exploited in, in, in manufacturing and taken out to, to the wider world. Um, so I think it's, it, it's finding key leaders that can bridge that gap mm. because we don't want everybody to be the same. You know, and Absolutely. we need those people that will work on the, the, the blue skies or the, the fundamental research. They need to still exist. And I don't believe that we should um, stop uh, any areas of, of, of research. People need to be free and creative because you don't know what, what's going to come out of that. And just because it doesn't have an application now doesn't mean in five years time or 10 years time, we won't have an application for it. So sure. it's getting that fine balance. So I think it's really about um, finding a common language, um, but also trying to marry up the, the driving forces of modern day academia and, and, and industry. You know? yeah. And they're, they're on a different level sometimes. Um, so it, it's not easy, um, but better, better, better communication between the two two you know disciplines but sectors if you if you like yeah. and 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 i think that's going to take people to how do you communicate your science effectively or your engineering effectively to the industrial users yeah, um, yeah. but that's about open dialogue and, and being honest with each other really absolutely i know you know clearly you've you've got the two the two different planes haven't you you've got academia you've got industry or in this case manufacturing um mm -hmm. you know would, would there be would there be an argument to have some sort of middle ground and i guess you know a lot of smaller businesses just haven't got the, the funds or the resources to mm -hmm. do it um or or even you know in some cases the the the, the, the technical capability within that business which is why industry relies on research yeah. and, and academia could some of the larger businesses sort of have their own in in not necessarily solely in-house but you know mm -hmm. you've, you've got those two parties is, is there a sort of solution where there could be that bridge where you've got academia but working in industry or do you sort of lose would you lo lose the, the, I think potency of the academia there are examples of that, and that you know the, the people like EPSRC or the Royal Academy of Engineering. They they often um, put specific uh, grant um, calls out there so that yeah. we can bridge the gap. So somebody from industry can come and spend time in academia, and, and vice versa. You know, you've got 
uh, institutions like the MTC, which yeah. was that, that's what it was really about is taking knowledge from from um, universities and can we exploit those through through UK, you know, manufacturing industries. Um, and they do do that well, you know, um, so there are pockets of that. It's about trying to bring them all together and make, make more of it. Um, yeah. And how do we how do we make our academics more aware that actually because a lot of the time there's that competing where you, as an academic, your currency is, is publications. Yeah. And so they publish things and then go, oh, well, we can't patent that now because you've you've published it and what I would say to those academics is just go just take a step back could you actually put an application you know for a a pattern in there and then do your publication and you can meet meet both and it's getting that compromise but I think a lot of academics don't realize that there's there's novelty in in a lot of things well I I just published it but you're like well if you published it you know it's got novelty so if it's got novelty there's there is a a possibility of being able to to protect that and secure that ip which then helps the communication with with industry and how you might exploit that in in industry yeah so again it's about educating them really about what does industry want but industry also being educated of how does academia work and what are the constraints because they don't always well they don't work on the same model so Mm. sometimes those models sort of come uh, a lock heads with each other yeah yeah Okay, so you mentioned uh, earlier on in the conversation uh, Meta Additive, um, and I understand this is a business that you sort of developed as a spin out from the University of Liverpool. How did that come about? Uh, good, good question. Uh, I always say, well, it started in the pub. <laughs> That's all the best. That's a great place to start. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it's. Uh... Uh, uh, why I said well, it did start in the pub and that was because we were just chatting with, with one of my colleagues as I said he worked in, in a, uh, one area I worked in another and it's about starting having those conversations and you know I say to academics to have those great ideas you do need that freedom and the space to be able to be creative and thinking and yeah. hence why I say about happening in, in the pub I'm not saying that all great ideas have to happen in the pub but you, you get my drift um <laughs> So, yeah, it started really with with um, a conversation saying, well, could we marry that with this? Um, we then put in for patent application, applied for, for an EPSRC grant, so a Government UK um, Engineering Council grant, um, which we're fortunate to, to get. And that really kick-started the, um, the idea because it took the idea into a proof of concept. Actually, this has probably got legs. I was looking for something that would sort of stretch me a little bit more as much as I, I love um, lecturing and, and doing my other, you know, academic jobs. I, I always had a feeling that why do we keep research in universities? We need to get it out into to yeah. the world. And I thought maybe this was something that, you know, people should at least have the opportunity to, to see. I had the the EPSRC grant actually had industrial backing on it. So Simon Scott, who is now the CEO of Meta, he was um, involved in the project through an industrial background. He was advising. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, I just thought, well, I've got nothing to to lose. Why don't I ask him whether he wants to to come and, you know, join us on this journey? And and Chris Sutcliffe, who was a professor here at the University of Liverpool, he was a already a world leading expert in laser based powder fusion you know um the three of us we, we we set it up together so we went to the university and said we'd like to do this they were very yep. supportive um so we founded meta in 2019 october 2019 um and it really went from from there i mean it was a bit bit daunting when we went into lockdown in the march of 2020 yeah. it's like yeah. who sets a company up in a global pandemic um but we had we had a good team you know um you have to wear many hats when you're when you're a spin-out company and it was hard work but we we managed to get a a, an innovate uk smart grant and i think that really helped us kick start things and bring more team members on um yeah and then we we went from strength to strength there really it was um 
looking at doing additive manufacturing from a, a different angle, We're quite unique in the way that we, we, we do things. We think that chemistry plays a, a big role in, in, in additive manufacturing. Um, certainly for, for binder jet, which is, is what meta additive focuses on. Yeah. Um, and can we start to one broaden that palette of materials, but also can we start to look towards manipulating the materials and the, the parts that you print so that we can take those to, to automation, you know, yeah. looking at green part strength, looking at um, improving the, the, the physical properties of the printed components. And can we do that by, by chemistry? Um, and then, in 2021, um, we were approached by by Desktop Metal, and you know, really proud and pleased to to say that we're we're now part of the Desktop Metal family, and it's allowing Meta to 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 grow and take you know the technology to to the wider community, but also um, build on the the great expertise that that are housed in in Desktop Metal, and mm -hmm. um, can we join those to get together to take us to the next stage? Yeah. Brilliant, really exciting stuff. So yeah. what, what are the what are the current challenges in, in additive manufacturing in, in general, Kate, at the moment? I think um, two really is um, materials. Yeah. Uh, I always bang on about materials, but that's because, you know, I'm a material scientist and chemist at heart. Um, but, I, I, you know, I firmly believe that engineering is just a, it, it, it's an idea in your head if you don't have the materials to do it. So materials are really key. Everything that we yeah. have, you know, what we're wearing, the, the the table I'm sat in front of here is materials. So if we forget materials, how can we really accelerate? So we, we really need to, to understand how they work. So broadening that palette of materials for, for additive manufacturing, being able to keep the, um, get the supply chain in. So the raw starting materials for the powders, but also for the binders, that's really key. And it is something that we're, we're looking at, at in, in, in Meta and, and through, through desktop metal. Yeah. But can we move it to the next level by looking at automation? Um, and, you know, years ago, people would laugh, oh, you, you can't really automate uh, additive manufacturing. You can't move it up to mass manufacturing. I think Bindergate is, is, is one of those technologies from additive manufacturing that, if, if any can do it, then it's definitely binder jet because yeah. it has such a greater flexibility and being able to scale up, but also to be able to automate it. But to be able to automate it, we need to put the infrastructure around it to, to be able to do that. So we need to really look at the, the, the components that have been coming out of the, the, the printer. So yeah. things yeah. like green part strength, you know, so that we can automate depowdering or, or get rid of depowdering altogether can we use special binders that might might help that so i think materials but how do we take it to to the next level to be able to to, to automate and mass manufacture additive manufacturing it may not be possible for 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 all but how mm. can we take it to a a wider sector of end users yeah brilliant thank you for explaining that and it's it seems like there's a, a whole you know raft of of interesting research and work to be done to to get to that next level and yeah. uh i'm sure you'll enjoy the the journey um along the way as well so just before we um we're almost out of time now but I, there was one thing I, I did want to ask you about before we sort of uh, wrap up today um and this is the uh the live wise or live wise liverpool women in science yeah. and engineering I understand you set that up some years ago. Uh, was it 2013 or? Yeah, I set it up when, when I became a, a lecturer here in the School of Engineering. Um, I mean, we've come on leaps and bounds, but when, when I was appointed, there were no female academics in the School of Enge Engineering. Um, they were PhD students, but, you know, it's like all um, universities, numbers in engineering of, of females are, are, are pretty low. Yeah. Um, I mean, numbers of engineers are low, full stop, um, but certainly for, for, for women. And so when I was appointed as, a, as a, um, an academic here at Liverpool, I thought, why don't we set something up? We didn't have any other really, um, we didn't have many women. I think we had uh, two female appointees that came a month after me. So we started to go, we've gone from none to three now. So we're yeah. going in, in, the, in the right progress. And, and you know, we've, we've got uh, around 14, 15 female members of staff now here at the School of Engineering. And things have, things have, have changed quite significantly. And, and there's still work to do, but um, mm. we're moving on. But LiveWise was part of that. How do we create a culture where, um, women feel that they've got a place in, in engineering. You know, if um, if students are walking through the door 
and they've been lectured but to you know on a daily basis but they don't see female faces what does that say to, yeah. to female students um and so we've we've worked really hard and, and live was, was one of those things why we call it liverpool women in science and engineering is because you know i came from a chemistry background into into engineering and it was really about saying not just engineers not just scientists but us as a community and how can yeah. we collaborate together but showcasing talented female uh, you know scientists and engineers so we put on a whole host of events from you know uh, speakers that, that that come to the um to the university and these are they're all open to the public so it's not a closed forum um it's not just a female thing men men uh, are in the audience too but they're always female speakers and that's to, yeah. to create that body of of um role models um but we put on speaking events we do training events so we've had people like the bbc come in and um train our academic female academics of how you communicate your your science you know to a wider audience we go into schools but it, it, it's really about celebrating um yeah. all that is you know female scientists and engineers and they they are out there and they play a, a really important role and we need more of them and um you know i, I remember one mum and dad came to me one open uh, day and said well can you point it to their daughter and say can you convince her not to 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 you know she doesn't want to do engineering it'd be really difficult for her being a woman and i thought yeah we we need to stop that i thought that was really yeah. sad that you know and it wasn't because they didn't think that she would be good at it but they thought she, because she was a female she'd struggle in a male dominated area and we and we can't have that you know um Absolutely. there is a place in engineering for 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 women um we need that broad diversity and i don't just mean male and female diversity the true sense and meaning of the word um we will never um progress and create the innovations we need to survive um you know we're we're seeing all sorts of crazy things going on in the world wars yep. global pandemics energy shortage climate change we, we need everybody working together as a team um to to create the next generation of innovation so we need to we need to open that up absolutely yeah. and it's diversity of thought isn't it and you it know yeah. that's you'll only get diversity of thought if you've got a diverse range of people that speaks for itself so Correct. great yeah. to see the work that you're doing on that you know uh, and i'm sure there are other organizations that you may be partner with or, or talk to to uh, yeah. discuss other ways to to do more of that so um yeah i'm hugely supportive of all that all that kind of thing anyway great well uh kate it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today uh Hi, the first professor on insights <laughs> from manufacturing it's been a fantastic chat today and a great topic so thank you very much for for coming on the show yeah, um it. so that's it for today um thank you for listening look out for the next episode of insights for manufacturing see you next time and bye bye